Hey everyone, this is Jesse from Headway. Today we want to talk about how we can create a game using Live View in Phoenix. Yeah, so who remembers this game? Uh, yeah, this was a, a handheld game from the 90s called Lights Out by Tiger Electronics. And, uh, you know, as you can see, you had a, a 5x5 grid of buttons and the objective was, you know, you're given a set of buttons that were turned on and the objective was to uh, turn them all off. Um, but the trick was pushing one button um, actually affected the buttons around it. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of a strategy and a little bit of, um, you know, some calculation into how, you know, you would make your next move into turning all the lights off. So what we're going to do today is recreate this game using Phoenix and Live View and demonstrate some of the interesting features of Live View and also just show how little code you need to create a pretty interesting user experience. So what we're going to go over today is I'll show you how to set up a Live View project and we'll uh, wire up some events from our UI back to our server and kind of show you how easy it is uh, to kind of create this interactive experience in Live View. So uh, yeah, and uh, I'll leave links to the final project below as well as some information resources. So yeah, let's get started. All right, so let's go ahead and create our new Phoenix project. Uh, we'll use the phx.new command. Um, and if you need to install Elixir in Phoenix, you can go check out elixirlang.org and phoenixframework.org to get those set up on your machine. Um, and by default, uh, the Live View modules come included with new Phoenix projects, um, but we're going to go ahead and pass in the no ecto flag because we won't need a database for this particular project. So we'll go ahead and run that command, then it'll uh, bootstrap our new project. We will go ahead and install uh, the dependencies for it, and that will fetch those and compile them, and that'll just take a few minutes to complete. All right, our, our dependencies are fetched and compiled. So all we need to do now is jump into our project directory and run mix phx.server and we'll be off and running. If we go check out the URL in our browser, you see we get the uh, Phoenix start page. So we are up and running with Phoenix. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is uh, set up Tailwind with our project, which will give us uh, a bunch of utility classes that we can use and let us uh, style our game uh, really simply. So what I'm going to do is head over to the Tailwind site, and they have a, a great uh, set of documentation on how to get um, Tailwind set up with a Phoenix project. So I'm just going to go through these steps here and uh, get that set up, and then we'll uh, be ready to go. Okay, so I've got Tailwind set up and I've gone ahead and updated our uh, root template so that it will uh, remove any of the Phoenix stuff and get us ready to go to create our live view modules. So if we jump back to the browser, uh, we see we kind of have more of a basic view of the uh, Phoenix start page. So all the styles have been stripped out and we're uh, ready to get started to create our live view. So to create our live view, we'll jump back to our project here and we'll I'll create a new folder in our Lights Out Game web directory called Live. And in there, we'll create a file called board.ex. OK, and then we'll define our module, uh, Lights Out Game Web board. And then to bring in the Live View functionality, we will say uh, use Lights Out Game Web Live View. Then what we'll do is define a mount callback, which will uh, allow us to kind of set up the initial data for our live view. So what we, we know we want to set up a uh, five by five grid. So what we can do here is use an Elixir list comprehension, which basically takes two ranges of numbers and combines them into this map structure that we're going to use to represent our grid. So what we end up with is a data structure that looks something like this where you have uh, a sets of tuples that represent the coordinates and their values are all set to false initially. And then lastly, what we'll do is we will uh, send back an OK tuple and assign the value of the grid we just created to uh, our socket so that we can access that from the front end. All right, and then to render out our template, what we'll need to do is create a another file in this directory and we'll call this uh, board.html.hex, which is the uh, Phoenix Live View template extension. So we'll go ahead and create that. And what we'll do here is we will 
uh, use a similar list comprehension to render out the values that we set in our grid and use that to print out a uh, grid of buttons that we can interact with. And I'll just add some uh, container classes here um, to kind of just give us a little bit more style. And then the last thing we'll need to do is to jump into our router and set the root route to be our live view rather than the uh, Phoenix start page that's there now. So we'll jump down to here. And save that. And then if we jump back to our browser and refresh, we get a nice grid of buttons. All right, so now we want to add some interactivity to our grid. Uh, to do that, we can use uh, the built-in DOM bindings that Phoenix provides. Um, there's several of these that come out of the box uh, for click handlers, key presses, form events. Um, but for this, we'll use a, a PHX a click um, binding and we'll give it the name of toggle. So this is the name of the event that we'll be passing back to our live view process. And what you can also do is supply uh, values for the parameters um, that the event handler will take. So we do value x and y, and we'll also set a data attribute uh, to uh, determine whether or not this particular button is on or off. So back in our live view module, we'll need to define an event handler that can capture this toggle event that we're sending. So to do that, we'll use the handle event function, and for the event name, we'll use the toggle and then we'll set up the parameters that we're passing in, which are the X and Y coordinates uh, of the button. In this case, those come in as a map, um, and it's important to note that those will be string values coming in as we'll need to cast those into integers uh, so we can reference them uh, in, the in the grid. So the first thing we'll do is we'll grab the current grid off of the socket of signs, and then, as I said, we'll cast those uh, X, Y values to uh, integers from their strings. Then we'll create an updated grid, which takes the current values from the existing grid based on those XY coordinates and essentially flips the value in that position. And finally, we'll return a no reply tuple and we'll reassign the socket's grid value to that new updated grid. And I've tweaked the CSS so that it uh, acts upon the data attribute that we created um, in the template so that now if you click on a button to toggle it, you can see that it changes the background color from, from that grayish to that red. Um, so we essentially can now toggle on uh, the buttons in the grid. And that's it. With just uh, a few lines of code, we were able to wire up uh, our front end and our back end and get some interactivity in our app. So next, I think we can jump into how we actually build the logic for uh, the Lights Out game. So let's dive into that next. OK, so we've created our grid and we've added some interactivity with our buttons uh, to talk to our Live View module. Now what we want to do is actually apply the logic of the Lights Out game uh, to our click events. Um, so we know in the Lights Out game, when you click a button, um, it doesn't just turn that button from on to off. It actually affects the buttons uh, directly around it. So if you were to click this middle button, all of the lights uh, directly adjacent to it should turn on. Um, and similarly, if you were to turn, turn it off, that middle button off, all of the ones should turn off as well. Um, so let's figure out how to apply that uh, to our click event. So what I'm going to do is define a function uh, called find adjacent tiles, which will take in the x, y coordinates uh, that we pass it from our click event and determine which tiles around that coordinate to, uh, to also toggle. So it happens in Lights Out that when you click a button um, and it affects the buttons around it, those, those buttons don't wrap around to the other side of the board. So we know that we have some boundaries that we're working with. So We'll, we'll find the uh, previous and next values for each of the x and y coordinates. Um, so for the previous x coordinate, it's either going to be the very first column, which would be 0, or 1 less than the one we clicked on. For the next x coordinate, it's either going to be uh, the, the last column, which in this case is 4, or 1 plus the coordinate that we clicked on. Similar to x, the previous y coordinate, 
will be either the first row, the zeroth row, or one less than the one we clicked on. And for the next y coordinate similar to x, it will be either the last uh, row or one plus the y coordinate that we clicked on. And then finally, we're going to pass back a list of tuples, uh, which include all of these coordinates and the original uh, x, y values that we passed in. And I'll show you why we need all of these in just a second. So now we have a list of values that represent the changes that need to happen to our grid when we click a button. So let's use that to define how our grid gets updated in our toggle event. So our updated grid is now going to get its values from our find adjacent tiles function. We're going to take that list that we get back from that function and we're going to pipe it into uh, enum.reduce. And essentially what we're going to do is take that list of coordinates and transform it into a map that we can merge into our existing grid. So for each value in that list, we're going to put a new value into our updated map at the point in which we uh, determine from the adjacent tiles function and flip its value from the current value that it has in the grid. And finally, we'll take that uh, updated grid that we've created and we'll merge that into our existing grid from our socket. Now what we should have is an updated grid that represents the game logic of Lights Out. So let's check it out. Now if we reload our game and we click on a button, we see that the adjacent tiles around the clicked button actually toggle their state as well. And if we click on a corner button or one of the ones on the edge of the board, it does not wrap around to the other side of the board. So it looks like our logic is working just as we expect. Okay, so now let's load up an example game state and see if we can click through and turn all the lights off. So what we'll do back in our mount callback is we'll create a new variable to represent the game state of an initial level of lights out. And we'll merge that in with our empty grid. And if we jump back to our board, now we should have an initial game state. Great, let's try to play it. All right, we got all the lights out, except how does our game know that we've actually won? Uh, let's define that function now. All right, so let's define another private function called check win. And what that will do is check all of the values in the grid and determine if every single one of them is false. So to do that, we'll take grid, we'll pipe it into map.values, and then we'll pipe that into enum.all. And here we just want to see, is every single value in the grid false? Uh, if not, it will return false for the win value. And we can actually write this uh, using Elixir's anonymous function syntax to get even an even shorter version of that function, which looks pretty nice. Okay, so we've got a function to check the win. Now we need to let our live view know about the, the value of the win state. What we'll do is we'll declare a new uh, initial value for win in our uh, socket assigns. And then after we update our grid, we'll create a new variable called win, which will call that function on our updated grid and see if it's in the win state. And then finally, we'll pass back that value in our socket with the updated grid. Then back in our template, we can show a simple message that displays only if win is true we can use the special Phoenix if attribute uh, to toggle that on or off. And let's add just a little bit of styling there uh, just to show it. Okay, so now if we jump back to the browser and we play through the game again. Hey, now we know that we won, great. That's kind of boring though. Uh, maybe we can spice that up just a little bit. Okay, so we're going to be using this Canvas Convetti library to add a little pop to our win state. And Live View can send events to the client side and we can listen for those and take action on them. So let's see how we do that now. So 
So we're going to move the socket assignment up to here. And then we're going to check on the win state. And if the win is true, we're going to push an event to the client. If not, we'll just send the socket back to, to the uh, application as normal. So we'll add a quick case statement here. Which will send that event back to the client if it's true. If not, we'll just simply return the socket in the no reply tuple. We won't need that one anymore. Now, if we open our app.js file, uh, we can add an event listener to window. And we'll use that same event name that we defined in our board.ex, which was game over. And that gets prefixed with the PHX. Um, and then we'll, we can take action on that event here. So what we want to do is grab the uh, win value off of the detail from the event. And then if that value is true, we're going to define a function that uh, shoot some confetti out to show, show that we've won. So we'll just call that shoot confetti and we'll find that right now. If you want to learn more about Canvas confetti, you can check out the link to their uh, project. Um, I'm just going to define the function here and uh, you can see kind of how we're just defining a few colors and um, you know, defining the function here that's going to shoot them out at different angles and things like that. So, um, so now we have an event coming from our board that's saying, if we've won, push this event to the client and we have a listener on the window that will listen for that event. And uh, hopefully when that event is captured, it will shoot some confetti out. So let's check it out. All right, our game is reloaded and we'll play through this first level one more time. Click through here, turn off the last light Bam, now we have some confetti. That's a little more fun. All right. So you can see that not only is it easy to handle events um, in your live view module, like we did with the toggling of lights on and off, um, it's also fairly simple to send events to the client side um, and have your JavaScript side of things listen to those events and take action on them. And you can even pass events back from JavaScript uh, to your live view module. So lots of power in live view. Um, and lots of things that we um, didn't cover today, but I think we were able to get a pretty good sense of uh, you know the simplicity of Live View, um, the power of it, and how you can set up a, an interactive application fairly simply um, with with fairly few lines of code and um, without even reaching for uh, an external JavaScript framework. So, so some ideas for some next steps. Uh, we can add a mechanism for navigating through the levels. We only added the first level here, but it should be fairly simple to um, add a way to go through the different levels and load them in as needed. Uh, another cool idea could be leveraging some of the great real-time features of Phoenix and Live View to maybe make a, some kind of multiplayer version of this game. You know, having people uh, compete head-to-head -head or try to solve puzzles together. Um, that kind of thing is is also fairly easy to do uh, with Live View in, in their system here. So um, that could be cool as well. Yeah. So thanks for uh, for watching today, and, and hopefully you've learned something about how uh, Live View and it works in Phoenix. And um, I'll leave links to uh, the project and some other uh, information sources below. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions uh, about LiveView or Phoenix. Um, I'm Jesse at Headway. Uh, thanks a lot.